Hey folks, welcome to um, Lisa Live. This week we're talking about all things zinnias. And um, so I'm just so glad everybody is hoping we're gonna fill up here and um, we're gonna have some folks join us. Hey, Susan Gordon. And um, so we have folks that are falling in now. I see it, it's starting to happen. So I'm just so glad you guys are here. I don't know about you, but here in Virginia, we have gone from, it was almost 80 degrees here yesterday, and now we're back to blooming freezing today. I mean, this is really classic Virginia weather, maybe not quite as often and as severe as we're having it this year, but good morning, Susan. Oh, is it cold in New Hampshire? Good morning, Jennifer and Hannah and Wendy. Um, good morning, Jennifer. Um, so I'm just glad everybody's here, and I thought I was gonna be late. I came out, running out to the building, and I didn't have the key, the door was locked, I had to run back in. Then of course, Barry had to have a snack, so anyway. But I have, once again, all my little pieces of paper. Hey, Kenny Sloan, and Hannah, and Lisa. Hey, and Patrice, um, and Terry. Yep, Terry's in Virginia, and Hey, Kathy and Julie. So anyway, so we're gonna talk about some zinnias. Um, I'll tell you that every time I mention zinnias online, it's like, it just pops. So I wanna just tell you a really, really short story first. I really, zinnias, I guess we all think of them, not all of us, but many of us, think of them as such a simple, just good old garden flower that we tend to underestimate the power that they have. So when I first started flower farming, of course I was growing zinnias, but I didn't grow that many of them. I mean, I grew them, but in proportion to other things that I was growing, they were just a small sliver of my offering. And I was growing, oh my goodness, back in the beginning, I was growing all kinds of different stuff. Um, I, I grew tons of lilies and lots of bulb crops. And anyway, it took me about mm, five or six years to really grasp how people love zinnias, you know? So, you know, we have this members only market here on the farm and back in those days, we were also going to farmer's markets, two of them, three of them, yeah, three. And every week, you know, our customers would come in and particularly here on the farm, that morning market, I would say, oh, come over here and look at this gorgeous, you know, LA hybrid lily or this gorgeous oriental lily that, you know, not only are they expensive, a high risk crop to invest in, um, they're a lot of work. You gotta plant them and then unplant them and that's a whole conversation itself. Anyway, the ladies would come in and they would say, oh, that is a beautiful lily. I'll take zinnias. It took several years of that for me to finally realize how much people really love zinnias. So that has just snowballed over the years. That is not only true with home gardeners, with people that love cut flowers, but also with commercial customers, not all of them, but many of them. So we're gonna talk, hey, Kara and Cynthia, um, yeah, zinnias, it is. The zinnias are the most anticipated flower too on our farm. So before we get started, I wanna just say a couple of things. As always, I appreciate everybody joining us. What you can do to really help me is to like and then share this broadcast after it's done that was just really would, that helps us with Facebook and sharing it also saves it on your, um, I do not know why, my phone just came up and said it's recording had a problem. So if I get cut off, I will be right back, okay? I'm wondering if the Wi-Fi is not on. So stand by y'all, if I lose you, I'll be right back. Okay, so that happened twice so far this morning. That's never happened in my building. And as many of you know, we've had all kinds of work that's going on here with security cameras and Wi-Fi and business. So if I lose you for any reason, I will come back on. Um, so I'm sorry about that. We're figuring this all out. 
So I just want to, so I was saying, if you share this, then this saves it on your timeline on Facebook, but it also really, really helps me. And another thing that I want to say is for the flower farmers or aspiring flower farmers out there, this is kind of an insider trading tip. If you're not already signed up for our farm news newsletter that comes every week, you need to go in and do it before this week's. Normally they go out at the end of the week because this week has got a fabulous blog. I invited some other flower farmers to collaborate with me, one of which was Jenny Love, who is just such amazing flower arranger. Um, she's a veteran flower farmer, but she's really not been doing it for that long. She's just done it so much. Anyway, so it's a great blog, which everybody's gonna be able to see the blog. But the other announcement that's in that newsletter is that I'm gonna be doing a free webinar about flower farming, but there's limited seating because the problem is how many people we can, they'll allow us to have at a webinar is based on how big of a plan I purchase. So it's not as big as I know that we're gonna need. So the moral of the story is sign up for our newsletter so that you'll know the moment that, um, my door just opened behind me, stand by. Sorry about that. Thought somebody was coming in, but the, I just didn't shut it. Um, so the moral of the story is you want to know the minute that that blog goes live so you can sign up. The link will be on that to sign up for the free webinar, um, which is just another new territory. Um, and my sister just post sent me a text and says, horizontal. You may also notice last week we changed the direction um, that the, the phone was in. But I'm telling you, I went in and looked on the way it looks on my blog posted, these Facebook Lives, and it doesn't seem to make a difference. So, sister, thank you for that reminder, but I'm doing a test. Um, so, sign up for our newsletter. You can go right over to our website, thegardenersworkshop.com. Sign up so that you can get in on the free webinar. So, and I'm just reading all these things. So, And at the end of this broadcast, I'm also just going to share some tips on you know, getting everything done, y'all. I mean, I'm piling it high right now, um, and I know that you are too. So I want to just start off, let's just start talking about our um, topic of the day, which is all things zinnias. And I do have questions that folks have submitted, and I'm going to address them last, because um, I'm just going to kind of talk about what I think you may need to know to grow great zinnias. So first off, you have to figure out what zinnias want, right? And that's really easy to figure out, and I can tell you what it is. They like hot sun, full sun, for at least eight hours a day. If you wanna grow great zinnias, you need eight to 12 to however, however many hours of light there are in the day, those zinnias wanna absorb every drop of that. Um, that really pushes them into their happy place. Um, and the other thing that I have figured out through the years, many of you that follow or have done our flower farming school or have come here on the farm for boot camp or something, know that I don't do nearly as much irrigation as most people assume that we do here, but I will share with you that this lesson I've learned the last two years, because we've had more rain than any farmer ever wants to have, one of the results of all that rain is we just had excellent zinnia production, meaning bigger blooms um, and more of them. So while zinnias are very drought tolerant, they will take abuse. You will get better and bigger blooms when they get regular moisture. And the other thing that um, we're gonna talk about fertilization in just a moment, but they love to sink their feet into great soil. They don't necessarily want really rich soil, but my goodness, we got a lot of people on here today. Um, we, they want rich, not rich, but healthy, loose soil that they can just sink their roots in deeply. And um, the way to do that is to not pump up your soil right before you plant your zinnias. That is one time to do it, but getting into the 
practice of constantly feeding your soil. That's what we do here on our farm. It's not about fertilization necessarily. It's about taking care of your soil, adding organic matter on a regular basis, covering your soil to protect it, meaning with some type of mulch. We use a lot of film, but our pathways are mulched often. And what that does is brings all those microorganisms, all the good things that live in your soil, the good guys that you want, ground beetles, earthworms, all of that stuff. When you cut, feed the soil organic matter and organic fertilizers, then cover the soil, which keeps it cooler and retains moisture, that brings the workers to the surface right where you need them. And I'm here to say that zinnias love that soil. I definitely attribute our um, abundant production of zinnias and the quality of our zinnias to the state of our soil. So it's not a one shot, give it a shot of something and get that, it's over time. So, cause I, I know that zinnias will definitely grow in crummy soil, but they may not be, let's put it this way, they'll be a D student in crummy soil, but if you give them what they want, they will be like on a roll over the top of their class, just amazing producers, okay? So that's what, that's what zinnias want. Sunshine, great soil, and some water. Not every day, um, and yes, I used um, tea tape, which is drip tape. We don't do overhead watering, um, which is not really good for most plants. Um, so that's how you can um, give them some moisture. So now I wanna talk about what are my favorite varieties. Well, there's two schools here. We have a lot of home gardeners on here and we have a lot of flower farmers on here. And necessarily one, they don't overlap a whole lot. There is some overlap, but first I wanna speak to the flower farming, the people that wanna grow great cut flowers um, and grow, have a lot of production, biggest blooms, double blooms, um, just the most gorgeous zinnias, right? So first I wanna just tell you another little short story. Probably, I'm thinking back, it probably was five, maybe six or seven years ago. I'm trying to think, it's right when we had just, were able to buy the adjoining property um, on our farm that we have now. And that, that had so much extra room, right? Up until then, I only had like a little bit more than a half an acre in production. And so all of a sudden I had like two more acres of land that I had access to that I could grow on. So I decided that I was gonna grow every zinnia that I could find. I went to wholesale catalogs where I'm able to buy from because I'm a commercial um, person. And I went to even to the like um, Park Seed and all the retail and I scoured. If I came across a zinnia that I didn't think I was already growing, I tried to purchase every variety of zinnia available out on the market. And then we planted them. Oh my goodness. We have pictures from this. It was crazy. I mean, it was such an eye-opening experience. So back then, um, Suzanne was still working out in the field on the farm as my niece Kelly was, and myself and Bobo, of course. Once we got to about, so we planted all of those mid-May, which would have been our second planting of zinnias here on the farm in warm season. Once we got to like the 1st of July when that garden was just in its glory. I mean, there was so, there's no way we could have cut them all. I mean, there was so many, there was so many more of them than there was of us. So, um, we stood back. It ended up being about 13 different large size zinnias that we grew. Cause I'll tell you another little secret that a lot of people don't know. You, you figure this out too when you get into the retail business as I did. Um, a lot of retailers, re, they buy seed to package and they just rename the zinnias so that it seems like they have a special one of a kind. So we knew that some of them were some of the ones we already had just renamed by a retailer. So we came up with 13 different big zine or bigger, you know, not the little teeny guys, anybody that would be decent size. And when we stood back and stood at the end of that garden, and I can remember us doing it and saying, we now understand why people just really croak 
over our Benary's Giants that we grow, which Benary's Giants, as I'll show you a picture in just a minute here, is the number one most commercially grown zinnia. It's the biggest, the most double, the most prolific, and the most mildew resistant. And there are other zinnias that are big, um, but when we stood back and compared the overall quality of bed to bed and then their cutting qualities, Benary's Giants, hands down, no comparison, beat out every other variety that we grew. So there you go. Um, and I, I did, I remembered to bring my book over here and see, there's the cool thing about a webinar that I'm doing. I'll be able to interact as well as do slideshows and not have to do this kind of stuff. This is from Vegetables Love Flowers. These are the Benary's Giants that are on page 67. And they're just fabulous, y'all. They come in amazing colors. Um, and commercially, that's the only zinnia that we really grow for all of those reasons. Now, so that's the one we grow the bulk of. I do, every year, add a couple of other little specialty zinnias that we like to grow primarily for our members-only market. And this past year and the year before, we had excellent success with the new Queen series. There's several colors. We actually, um, on our store, thegardenersworkshop.com, we mix all the colors together and then package them because people don't typically, home gardeners anyway, don't wanna buy five different or four different packs of seeds. We have been growing some gorgeous Queen mix and that is the antique colors, lime green with blush, so I would say to you, those are my two favorites, Benary's Giants and the Queen for the home gardener as well as the commercial grower, but commercial growers, we don't really even consider anybody else. I did used to grow an awful lot of the Oklahoma series, which is a smaller, it's just, it's met by Benary's. Benary's is a German hybridizer. They're from Germany is where they come from. And the Oklahoma, they describe it as like an inch and a half bloom and they're like little miniature Benary's Giants. They are fabulous in bouquets, but they're just small. And when you get to be a commercial grower, you find out it's as much work to, to get that little teeny bloom as it is the big one. And it's not as valued by commercial customers, but in a bouquet business, if you're making bouquets, if you're a home gardener, Oklahoma's, oh my goodness, Oklahoma white is the cleanest white flower I have ever grown. They're just absolutely beautiful. So for farmers, Benary's Giants all the way. We grow some of the cut, we grow most of the colors, not all of them. And in the home gardener, definitely the most beautiful and for the longest stem. So why do we love them? Long stems, prolific, they are reliably double voluptuous blooms, um, and they're just absolutely amazing. So the questions, a couple of questions um, that I'm gonna address here in a moment, but they were part of my talk anyway, is someone asked, how do you support them? Because for great cut flowers, well, and really, any flower plant that grows over hmm, 24 to 36 inches really could benefit from support. All it takes is one torrential downpour to smash everything down. So the question that I was asked, do I net with flower support netting or do I corral, like corral horses? And I will say to you that I, I have corralled in the past. Corralling is not nearly as effective as netting. It is takes more tending, you're constantly fussing with it. And so I net, and yes, we net zinnias. And the, I think the remark that was made was, it's just so hard to cut through it. Cutting through netting is not nearly as hard as you think it is once you figure it out. You just have to come up with your method and go for it. I can harvest zinnias so quickly, and I go through the netting, stripping, whole, you know what I mean? Doing it fast and doing a lot. So we go with netting. I just found it's more efficient. I can use the netting from year to year, and 
it really does keep the flowers upright. The corralling, in my opinion, the way I've seen it used, you still lose some. So we definitely net them. So what about spacing? We grow in a cutting garden setup. We grow in 30 to 40 inch beds. I do 30 inches, but you could do up to 40 inch wide beds. We put four rows within that bed. You would just evenly space them out. I went from when I first started farming, first I had 48 inch beds. Then as I got a little older, because it's hard to reach to the middle. It's a back breaker on harvesting on wide beds. That's one reason I do 30 inch beds. It's much, much more efficient harvesting for us. And we literally grow the same thing in the 30 inch bed that I used to grow in a 48 inch bed, right? So figure that out. So we grow in 30 inch beds and we put four rows and they're just evenly spaced out into the bed kind of going a little closer to the edge, you know, you can kind of get close to the edge and then space out your, your rows. Within the row, we space six inches apart. And I know everybody's going, oh my goodness, that's so close. But you have to remember, this is not a landscape bed I'm talking about right now. This is a cutting garden. And you're gonna be cutting it deep and hard twice a week, which is like giving a tree a severe pruning twice a week. So you have a lot more room with, I mean, air space, light, um, for plants to be in because you're constantly cutting stems. So four rows to a bed, six inches within the row. So let's see, fertilization. So I have changed my story on fertilization probably in the last three or four years. Everything on this farm, typically when we prepare beds, gets a dose of dry organic fertilizer. We use different types, chicken litter based, seaweed, we change it up all the time. There's no reason to use one product and stay with that all the time. And I see in lots of questions coming up, I'll go back and answer, I'll scroll through after I get the other questions and answers done. So everything on this farm gets a dose of dry organic fertilizer when we prepare beds. Xenia beds typically get nothing else after that for the rest of the season. I used to fertilize them with liquid through the irrigation, again with like seaweed fish type fertilizer, run it through the irrigation, or you could pour it on with a um, watering bottle. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, watering can. But we've learned, and after talking to a uh, really good friend, Jim Orban, that's an extension agent, he shared with me that the fertilizer can cert fertilization during mildew season on zinnias really fuels the mildew also. So we just shut down all fertilization. And because we have such great soil that I talked about earlier, we're always building our soil, our zinnias really get plenty to eat. So we fertilize when we prepare, but then we do not fertilize anymore. But I tell you what we do do is compost tea. And I can't talk about doing compost tea, a future Facebook Live once it's not, you know, I think it's 28 or 30 degrees out there maybe. Um, once it warms up, we'll maybe do a compost tea demonstration. Compost tea, does have some nutrition in it, but not like fertilizer does, but it has microorganisms, the workers. I feel like it's taking the good stuff we're putting in our soil and putting them up on the leaves like little patrols, right? Um, and we have great success using compost tea on our zinnias to help fight disease and help um, them recover from disease. So compost tea, but not fertilization. And we also, grow in film, not plastic, but the biodegradable film, Bio360, you can find it on our website, thegardenersworkshop.com, in home gardener size, 50 foot pieces. That also helps with disease. Stuff is not, when it rains, rain is not splashing, spores up from the soil up onto your plants. So that just creates, again, a healthy environment and that really helps us to control disease. So I will 
go back. So we want to talk about harvesting for just a minute. Cutting, where do you cut? I will post on our Facebook page, or actually I'll see if I can't put it in this feed. You'll have to look for it. Of uh, The little video that's on our website, you can go to the website and watch it on where to make the first cut on a zinnia. And that really, I mean, a video is worth a thousand words, right? So I'm not gonna talk about that. You'll have to come back. I'll either post it at the head, the description of this Facebook Live, or it'll be in the feed. And um, I couldn't do that beforehand. And I will tell you, the harder and the deeper that you cut your zinnias, and you do it on a regular basis, one to two times a week, what you realize is that first off, you're cutting off all that ooky foliage. Somebody had posted, you know, their foliage is so ooky by the end of the season. They are so upset because they can't take photos of their beautiful zinnias. Well, when you're cutting your zinnias on a regular basis, like you should for a cutting garden and cutting deep enough, you're getting rid of foliage. It's constantly regrowing. So you don't really have that problem. So I'll do that. So mildew, I mean, that is, I got more, I got questions on Instagram and Facebook about this. First off, all zinnias get mildew, all of them. There's no magic plant you can grow that's not going to get it. It's an environmental um, influence. And what you can do is what we do. First off, no, and people offer all kinds of um, remedies, and I know there's good remedies out there but we don't do remedies here. We don't have time to do remedies. And when, so uh, first before we talk about my method of madness is practicing all those things we just talked about. We have healthy soil, we keep our plants healthy, we cut, the, we cut them hard and we cut them every twice a week. So we're constantly refreshing our plant. If I get a plant that gets really sickly, whether it's bacteria spot or mildew, I just cut it harder than usual. Don't drop it in the pathway because there's definitely spores there. I'll tell you my friend Jim Orban, who's that retired extension agent, he's just an exceptionally, his brain is so full of good information. When I was speaking to him, he said, well, Lisa, you just need, you don't drop anything in your pathways, get rid of all that debris. And it's like, Jim, I have like 1800 foot beds of zinnias not possible right but if i have a really sickly spot and i feel like i have time and i'll say okay i'm going to cut these plants almost down to just like a stem the stump of the plant and like one leaf or something on it i'll just cut it and i'll just drag those that debris and actually put it in the trash can i don't put it in my compost bin that's the way you can kind of rejuvenate but again my next method of madness is we succession plant. I talk about this. That's really a big part of my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, is how to incorporate succession planting into a small home garden. In flower farming school, we talk about it on a bigger, grander scale. So let's just say your first planting is coming up so sick. Well, if it just gets out of control, you should have a second planting coming along somewhere, right? I would just get rid of the first one. We spend and waste too much time doing CPR on stuff that there's just a better way. Yes, there are remedies. I know that um, years ago when I was thinking I was gonna remedy some of these problems, I know that um, for us here, Virginia Tech had a little recipe. I do not know what the recipe is. I'm sure you could search engine it that they suggested you could use. I think it was more of a preventative than a treatment, but my method of madness is cutting the plants down as I just spoke of, getting rid of those plants and seeing if you can't regrow a healthier plant and then succession planting, get being able to get rid of a sickly patch if you need to. But it all boils down to the overall health of your garden. And I'm telling y'all, that is what my book, Vegetables Love Flower, is really all about. How to restore nature to your garden. And zinnias, more than any other flower that we grow, benefit more from that. So that is my method of madness. And I will tell you the bottom line is 
give them sun, give them something great to sink their roots in, water them on a regular basis if rain does not come, and succession plants. So if disease is getting the best of you, then you can take it out. I will tell you that, so we plant, um, I call it my summer recipe, but a big part of my summer recipe, we plant it four times, are zinnias each time, right? And the colors sometimes change. That last planting that I make in the middle of summer, and I learned this from Jim too, I don't even put the dry organic fertilizer in the soil. The conditions in late summer and fall really help your zinnias get mildew. And so he suggested that maybe because of the fertility in my soil, I skip fertilizing. So if you wanna have great fall zinnias, plant them midsummer. you have to count back. You'll have to do the, how many days does it take to bloom? And then count it back from your first frost date, yada, 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 that's a whole conversation. And then plant midsummer for those flowers that you're hoping will be blooming in fall, but don't fertilize them. So your, your goal is to really get your soil in great, great shape. So I do also wanna mention, and I shouldn't say this on a Facebook Live because this will be on our blog. Oh, I wanna say that too. So if you wanna watch a past Facebook Live that you didn't save to your feed, or maybe it's just easier this way to find it, if you go to my blog on my website, thegardenersworkshop.com, it says blog, just go over there, scroll until you find a Lisa Live, one of them, and then it's category, categorized. You can click the category Lisa Live and it'll bring up all of my live events so you can find it easier. And I'm trying to tag them so that you they're kind of be a little bit more organized. But I wanted to tell you what the special promotion code is for the rest of this month. We have 20% off all of our seeds, and you can go in and grab all your favorite Xenia seeds until March 1st. It's just on seeds, and the code is, guess what? Seeds, S-E-E-D-S, -E -E okay? So you can use that through the end of March 1st, 2019. I'm saying that now, so when somebody looks at this at a future date and, um, get all your favorite seeds. We sell the Benaries Giants in the solid colors and in the mix. So that's what they really need. And now I wanna just talk about, let me find, you know, I'm gonna find my questions here. I do wanna say that I am just so loving this Facebook community we're building, right? It's just, y'all are just the most supportive. Um, I love you guys, you know, it's just, Really made, this is really very rewarding for me too. I love sharing information. And um, again, the more you like and share this, A, it'll be on your feed, but it lets other people learn about us and for us to build up our community. Um, so this is just really a great thing. So I have finally found it, the, met, the questions I wrote down. So um, Marissa asked on Facebook um, that she felt like her stems were so fragile um, and she, she's a flower farmer, and she's having trouble bunching them. And I will tell you, Marissa, the zinnia stems are fragile, but that's just the way it is. So for actually, like the top, I would say four to six inches of a zinnia stem is hollow. Maybe not quite that much. And so it really makes them, you can't manhandle them. We would never lay a bunch of zinnias down on a table. Like when we were making supermarket bouquets and we were using zinnias, we would never lay, pick up a whole bucket and lay it on the table to be used quickly in making bouquets. They're just too fragile. So we find that being aware of that, and we always hold the stems in the bottom third of the bunch, and you just have to, we try to have the canopy even so that there's no crushing going on. So Ed asked about fungal and bacterial spot, and you know, Ed, Yes, I do get that um, occasionally. And sometimes those are the zinnias that I mow down if I just can't cut them down, you know, remove all of the diseased part of the plant. If you don't have mulch or if you're using organic mulch like um, leaves or something like that, you might wanna remove that and put in new. If you have film, you should be fine. <clears throat> and try to restore the plant. And again, there's probably some, um, 
steps that you can take to help prevent that, but I don't know of any solutions to solve it once you actually have it. So our friend Wanda in Alaska asked, she said that she felt like she has, she struggles with zinnia. She felt like it was probably still too cool when she planted them. I want to say this, that, and I talk about this in Vegetables Love Flowers, zinnias are a warm season, tender annual. They want it hot and they want warm soil. They want hot temperatures and warm soil. If you try to push the envelope, and plant too early, they will resent you for their life. How do they resent you? Their disease resistance is less for like mildew and bacterial spot, and they just struggle. So yes, the goal here for us, or I guess the, the mark of when we know if we were just planting zinnias out into the open field without any protection, we would wait until nighttime temperatures are at 60 to 65 degrees and holding at night has nothing to do with daytime temps, y'all. I know the days are warm, but if the nights are still going down, zinnias will torture you for their season. Um, so yes, Wanda, I think it was definitely too cool when you planted them. And she also said that she got lots of single blooms. That means just one row of petals versus layer and layer and layer like the Benares Giants are. I would say that could be a result of a stressed plant, but typically it is variety selection. And that little test that we did that year of growing so many different ones, we found so many of them had some beautiful doubles, but they had more singles than they did doubles. And that's why we always grow Benares Giants. So Callie asked about mildew. Callie's one that asked about taking photos of her zinnias at the end of the season. I think that I've already answered that, Callie, that you just need to cut the plants harder and deeper to get rid of bad, bad um, foliage and then beef up your environment. So Kathy asked about the top 10 producers. Well, there's only one producer in Xenias for us as a commercial grower, and that's Benares Giants. We really just don't even consider any others for um, production. <clears throat> so this is kind of all subject. Um, <clears throat> Betsy has an infestation of a plant, a bishop, a weed in her area that got on her compost. And she was asking about would it still be okay to use it to make compost tea? I do not think that weed seeds, <clears throat> if it cooks properly, um, the tea steeps properly, that you would have a problem. So I think you can still use that for tea. So the big question somebody asked, and this, and I'm sorry I didn't write this person's name down, they're in zone four which is probably in Canada, I will guess, whether to direct sow or start zinnias inside. We start all of our zinnias indoors, and I'm even down here in the south. You just get a better stand of plants, but up there where you are with your short growing season, for sure, we start all of our zinnias in soil blocks two to three weeks before they go out to be planted. In soil blocks, they do absolutely beautifully. If you wait to sow them directly in the garden where you are in zone four, they you have to wait so much longer. I mean, you just buy yourself weeks of earlier blooms by starting indoors. So, um, so we already talked about netting versus corralling. Um, Diane asked about the longest, straightest stems, and for sure, um, Benary's Giants are the tallest. I mean, our Benary's Giants on a wet year, will grow 48 to 60 inches tall. They're just crazy. And then somebody on um, Instagram asked about, you may or may not, <coughs> excuse me, know what this is, Xenia meltdown, which is an undiagnosed phenomena that happens in Xenias. Doesn't happen everybody, it doesn't happen every year. It's when you, let's just say you cut your Xenias today you come in tomorrow morning and like a whole bucket looks like somebody poured acid on it or something. They're just mush. They, it stinks. They're horrible. NC State, North Carolina State University is doing a lot of looking into that. If you're a grower, um, you need to be a member of the ASCFG and have access to all that um, um, research that's going on and what the results are. Uh, I do not have an answer for Xenia Meltdown, and I have experienced it before. 
So I am gonna, I do just wanna pause right here and say, remember to like and share this, please, y'all, and head over to thegardenersworkshop.com and sign up for our farm news if you want to be get in on our limited seating of the free webinar on flower farming that I'll be doing. Um, and I wanna just give you a few tips. I thought about this yesterday. So we just, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm heading out on a 12 day book lecture deal here soon and the farm goes on you know everybody the family's still here and everybody's still working but there's certain things that I'm responsible for and I have just been making these ridiculous lists of things that I have to do to be gone that long at this time of the year and yesterday when I kind of like high-fived myself and patted myself on the back I thought you know I just need to share a little bit because I know that y'all are, everybody faces this kind of stuff. And what really helps me is to really break down, first off, I make ridiculous lists, and those are like my dream lists. And then I actually pull time sensitive things from that list, and then I start really making chore lists. And the secret for me to making a chore list that I can actually achieve, do, is to make a reasonable list, y'all, right? So there's all these things. I have piles of bags of leaves all over this farm. I don't have enough, but I have them everywhere. That's a job that'll be there when I get there. So I had to prioritize. Our Lysianthus plugs are due to arrive here this month. I did not make my bed in fall like I normally do. I've been fighting wet weather. That was like a boulder on my shoulder and we wanted to direct seed some vegetable seeds. Our dahlias survived winter outside in spite of everything and they needed some attention. So for me, just really breaking my chore list down into steps so I can like have that feel good girl for what I just did. And I did that yesterday. So Bobo and I made the Lizzie bed on Thursday. We got some landscape fabric laid down in pathways around it, which was a major coup, but there were still things to be done to kind of finish that whole garden off. And I just sat down and made a list of three things that I could do without Bobo on Friday. And I did them yesterday. And you know what that empowered me to do, even though I was pooped? It empowered me to say, you know what? I'm gonna plant the peas and the beets. They were kind of on my other list that I hadn't added because it's such a feeling of accomplishment and just don't overload yourself is what I'm kind of saying to you. You gotta set your garden and mind straight is what you have to do. And you also have to get rid of stuff that's needy. I just crossed off some stuff and literally threw it over the fence. So um, I just wanted to share that making a list you can actually accomplish empowers you to maybe grab something off your big list that you can still do. So I am going to now, you know what I think I might do? I'm gonna, I have an iPad in front of me. I wonder if it wouldn't be easier. Give me a minute just to log on here. I'm gonna see, I don't know how this will work. I wonder if I can see the Facebook Live on here and scroll the questions. Hmm. I'm gonna start. Brain dump, yes, yeah, saw somebody. That must have been one of my flower farming school students. Yeah, that's, we do brain dumps, y'all. Brain dumps are good for anybody, not just flower farmers. So let's see. Uh, that iPad's taking too long. This looks easier. So let's see, we get some questions. So, oh my goodness, hey. Oh, and Wanda is on here. Wanda's in Alaska, snowing here. Hope you heard me answer your Xenia question. And Kenny's here. Kenny um, is a farmer right here near me from Minnesota. I know you're freezing. I have sunburn and now it's cold again. It's true, my husband had sunburn on his neck yesterday. We got Kentucky on here. And Rachel from the UK, oh me. So many of y'all, I just, and from Louisiana, Helen, I'm coming to Louisiana, you know, March something, March 8th, I think. Um, I just love meeting here with you guys, New York. There's another Louisiana. All right, y'all, I right, know I'm here. Oh, Devil's Ridge Flower Farm. There's another one. Oh, and somebody from Canada. Yes, 
Jenny, um, Jenny Love. So you want you don't want to miss my blog coming out this week. Um, Jenny and two other rising, in my opinion, rising star flower farmers um, chimed in and were sharing myths and things they wish they'd have known when they started flower farming. So let's see, Kathy. Hi, Lisa. I quit growing zinnias in my Michigan garden because they seem to get powdery mildew. I fear growing them on a larger scale. Suggestions. Well, Kathy, I totally get it. But oftentimes we're doing something to create that powdery mildew. And if you weren't on, um, when I talked earlier about creating this healthy environment of great soil, um, growing them in film or mulch to keep them from um, just really spreading the spores jumping up, cutting hard, um, all of these things. And also to have it in a, a make um, in an area where they get enough sunlight. So all of those things, but I, I'll just tell you, some years it's worse than others, no matter what I do. So you just, and I, I, I also have spots that get worse. So let's see, and Joel, good morning. Oh, Oscar had technical difficulties. So, Oscar, everybody can go to, it'll be on the Facebook feed on the farm, but it'll also be on my blog, and you can easily find it there by clicking on the Lisa Live category. Okay, Diane, what do you use for spacing? It's hot and humid in Maryland, so we get lots of downy mildew. Yeah, so I did share the spacing, um, four rows, and I know this is tight and six inches apart, because I will tell you, even when I went two rows, 12 inches apart, first off, you cut the volume of flowers that you're going to get by a long shot. We, the years that we still fight disease because of environmental stuff, it didn't make any difference. So we just, hey, Shauna, where are you, girl? Are you still on here? That's my friend, Shauna, who's doing a wellness garden tour across the country for five weeks. So she's just having some great fun. Um, so you can follow her and Sheila Key. That's my friend Greg's wife of Haas Tools. Um, and we all love, and Tina's loving the rainbow colors. I think that's why everybody loves zinnias so much. There's just so many great colors. And also they come in lime green, the Benares Giants, but it's typically not in the mix. And so there's Kentucky and Atlanta and Arizona and Mississippi. Um, Pick some big giants this year for my first year. Um, so yes, Benary's Giants are, if you want cut flowers, Benary's Giants should be your go-to zinnia. Then you can add some of these others, because there's other, you know, we grew um, the cupcake, I'm thinking, cactus, they're all cute. The cactus, and, I, and Sheila's on here, the best cactus zinnias I've ever seen were the ones that her husband and son grew in Georgia when I was down there in Moultrie at the Sunbelt show. Um, they had the best looking um, cactus zinnias I've ever seen. But I'll tell you what our customers generally think about cactus zinnias. They think they're old flowers. That's why we don't grow them anymore. I love the orange. We sell Inca orange zinnia seeds, and it is beautiful. It's kind of frilly. So queen is really great. I see people talking about that. Oklahoma white, yeah. So we have the Oklahoma mix, the Benaries mix, the Benaries and all the colors, and then several other, what I call like secondary zinnias. We don't rely on them as our go-to big one. Brownlee, hi Lisa, our top question for you is how to prevent the stems of my zinnias from breaking. After a day, after a day filled with arranging, I haul my bouquets to my local market and many of the zinnia stems have broken towards the top one third of the stem and I have to remove them. What are we doing wrong? I would gander to guess it's the handling before they get to that stage. Again, we hold Every flower, not just zinnias, but it is so important with zinnias. If a stem is six inches long, let's just say you would never have a stem that long, but just for figuring, if you had a six inch long stem, I would hold the bottom two inches because when you hold any, 
higher up on the stem, you're stressing the, the necks of those zinnias. And I will tell you, I see people doing it all the time. When people come here for boot camp and for on-farm workshops, which I still think we do have one this year that still has a couple of spaces, by the way, we see people doing it. I have seasoned farmers come here and I watch them do it. You hold the stems at the bottom. And even if they aren't broken yet, when you're putting them into bouquets, that stress of the way that they're handled definitely um, can contribute to that. And my sister was on here. If Suzanne's on here watching, she's the one that really, I mean, we bunch thousands of zinnias every week and she uses them in bouquets. And it really is, don't lay them on a table and be careful that you hold the bottom third of the stem. Um, do you sell to wholesale florists? No. Well, I sell wholesale to florists, but I do not sell to wholesalers. And we do sell tons of zinnias. How do you clear your zinnia beds at the end of the season and still have the netting in a reusable state? Excellent question, Nicole. Because you know what the bottom line is? If you have been harvesting your zinnias like you're supposed to, hard and deep twice a week, you shouldn't have a lot of stuff coming up through your netting that makes it impossible to pull the netting off. So, and then you have to remove the netting the day after your last harvest because if you allow stuff to grow, to get, grow bushy again or weeds to grow up through it, you'll never get it off. Um, and it can be challenging. Two people taking it off is easier than one. A person on each side and you're, you've disconnected the posts, the stakes at the ends, and you just put your arms straight under the netting, a person on each side, and lift it straight up and go down the bed lifting, then you roll it up. So, um, But the problem is most people don't cut their stuff hard enough and there's a lot of stuff growing through it, but it shouldn't be that way. Do you ever use compost tea? Yes, I did speak about that earlier. That is one of the only things I do to my zinnias um, once they're in the garden and growing because we've stopped fertilizing them. Grow benaries, zinnias, you're absolutely right. Love them. And the bumblebees, oh, the bumblebees, the butterflies, and the hummingbirds on benaries giants are just fa fabulous. We also tried the queen this year's. We'll do netting this time. Thanks for your talk about zinnias. Very helpful. Greetings from the Netherlands. Well, glad you're here. Do you prevent, do you do a preventative fungicide early in the season? We use zero anything. We don't use fungicides, um, miticides, or pesticides, um, organic or otherwise. So no, we do not. And I don't know that that helps. Lisa, please talk about uproar. Uproar Rose. I wonder if there's a good picture of that in Vegetables Love Flower. Uproar Rose is a zinnia that we do. I'm glad you said that, um, Lisa. That's her name, too. There is not a picture of Uproar Rose in Vegetables Love Flowers. Huh. I mean, yeah. Uproar Rose is a new hybrid. Well, new as in probably six or seven years old. And it's the same size if not even more voluptuous um, than Benary's Giants. I mean, we grew some this year that were almost as big as my head. <laughs> they're just amazing, and they're a color. They call it mag magneta or hot, hot, deep pink, purpley kind of color. It's a color that's not in Benary's Giants, but it's a new hybrid seed, so it costs 20 times more than Benary's Giants do. Like when you buy a pack, a home gardener buys a pack of seeds from me, there's like, I think there's 10 or 15 seeds in a pack, not many. Their germination is 100%, um, but it's because they cost so much. Anyway, we absolutely love them. We also find that they're mildew resistant and they are incredibly prolific. You only need 10 plants. If you're a home gardener, five plants would probably be more than enough that you need. How many times through the seasons do you use compost tea? You know, I mean, if I could do it once a month, I'd be happy, but I never get to. Is compost tea fed through tea tape or spread on foliage? Excellent question, Susan. 
it really, we have always used it as a foliar feed. That means you spray or sprinkle it on the foliage. That's bringing the benefits of compost out of the ground and putting it up on the foliage. I think it builds bionic plants. Um, I'm sure there's a lot written about that out there that you can go check it out. I think that you could use compost tea once a week if you could. I don't know that you need to. I would do a little research, but for us, the goal would be once a month. We don't always get to do that. And um, the nutrition, hello, Ellen from California. The nutrition in compost is different than fertilizer, so it does provide a little meal. So there are benefits to that. Again, it's just a little bit more labor intensive, right, than just opening a bottle of organic fertilizer. Daniel, do you do do you know anything about Xenia meltdown? I think it you think I had it last year with all the rain, not backing off my irrigation enough, planning on watering my zinnias much less this year unless drought occurs. Totally agree with you. So Daniel, I am pretty sure you're a member of ASCFG. You need to search the quarterly. There's been a couple of articles on that, and I think that if I'm right, I think John Dole is in the process of trying to do a research project. One of his students is doing that. And so, yeah, back off of fertilization and water, and it's they say that's definitely environmentally induced, they think. Definitely think. That doesn't even sound right, does it? Anyway, so you just have to vary what you're doing. Some One year I got it, oh my goodness, early in the year. This was years ago. I had so many zinnias in our field, and I don't know if it's possible. Maybe it really wasn't zinnia meltdown. We grew out of it. I actually mowed a bad high and did let it go, and we grew out of it. So you really have to do your own experimenting. Love that I can listen while running errands. Mildew, that is why I succession plant zinnias. Yeah, having a backup crop, y'all, is really, that's the whole point of succession planting everything is if, a pest or a storm or something happens, you have something to fall back on. Out of the cool flower varieties you grow, of the cool flower varieties you grow, do any varieties continue to produce blooms into early summer while waiting for warm season flowers to start, like stock, calendula, bells of Ireland? Well, Fawn, I don't know where you are, Fawn, but we have an overlap. We because we transplant all zinnias to the garden, our first planting is typically mid-April, we are cutting zinnias typically the end of May. Well, cool flowers are in full blow making flowers at that time. June is tough around here because cool flowers are still going and all of our warm season stuff is doing going. So, some stuff is a flash crop. There are some things like larkspur doesn't last very long. Stock is a common, not, not a common cut. Um, but bachelor button snaps, Queen Anne's lace, bells of Ireland, not so much. Um, all of those are still going for us. So I don't know where you are, um, but we really get a long haul out of them. So good to know about finding other live events. I can't get online until well after 11 and appreciate that info. Yeah, so hey, thank you, thank you. I love all your info and have learned so much from your Cool Flowers book, thanks. Thank you for your wonderful growing. We all, so I'll tell you, I don't, I don't think there's any, pinch at what stage, who asked about? Pinch at what, it depends, Paul, on so many things, what plant it is, if I'm farming or if I'm in a home garden. If you're gonna pinch, pinching when they're typically under 12 inches tall is the most beneficial, but it definitely delays blooming. When you have a bad section of zinnias and remove it, what do you do to that area before you replant that section? Nothing. Um, I mean, Again, we don't treat for stuff. We typically will put compost down and organic fertilizer, our normal process. But if, for instance, I would not follow zinnias with another batch of zinnias in the same bed. We, that is one thing we definitely keep a mental picture of. Um, we got to go, y'all. It's getting too late. Um, we definitely keep track of rotation with our zinnias for that. I love the smaller zinnias. It does offer variety of diversity of texture and color. Um, 
Oh, there you are in zone in Minnesota. So she's not in Canada, zone four. Have you ever tried growing your own Lizzie's? I do grow Lizzie's, but I have started from seed. It's just not economical for me to start them from seed. They take too long to grow, so we order plugs. Um, so let's see. We can talk, so Kathleen's asking about a bunch of cool flowers, and we can talk about that on another um, talk because we're out of time here today. Idaho, Texas, y'all, so many people here. So I want to just close by saying, you may or may not have seen, we did have our cameras installed. We had a security system installed yesterday, and with that, we got a very special camera that has three different positions on my farm to move from garden to garden as it blooms. So that's something that's coming in the near future, a live stream of um, seeing us in the garden and what's going on. Um, so I did wanna mention that to you. Another reminder, if you haven't already, if you're interested in the free webinar about flower farming, you need to sign up for our farm news before the end of this week so that you get the email that announces our special blog with Jenny Love and a couple other flower farmers that's coming out at the end of the week. But in that blog will be the link to our free webinar sign up. And the seating is limited because of the plan size that I'm purchasing. I don't have unlimited number of people that can attend. So I really hope everybody can get on and do that. And please remember also to like and share this Facebook. Y'all did awesome last week. We had more shares than we've ever had and it helps us so very, very much. Let's see. So wait a minute, I will answer this. Somebody's asking, okay, and vegetables love flowers. I do put a variation of spacing on most all the plants I talk about. The closer spacing, which is six inches, is for a cutting garden. A wider spacing is for like a landscape. So I always go closer for a farming application is that yes. So that answers that. Oh, well, I would love to come to Myrtle Beach. So y'all, I still see there's more on here. I cannot answer all these. I'm sorry, we were already going over an hour. Let's see. California Giants grew great for me. And you know one thing I found, that there were a couple of other Xenia varieties that I thought were pretty great until I grew side by side with Benary's Giants. So let's see, and so I also wanna say, the online course, the Easy Cut Flower Garden, I wanted to say about building soil, that's available on our website on the online courses, which is only 20 bucks. Not only is it about a cutting garden and harvesting and all those things, but I show how to build great soil using a shovel, y'all. So that is a great place for a lot of people to start. So I um, I cannot answer all these. I am so sorry. We'll, next, we'll be back. So next week, I haven't announced what's gonna be talking about. We might just have a Q&A because I'll be coming to you, I think, from Texas. Um, and so I look forward to seeing you again. Please remember to like and share so we can keep doing these. And our Facebook lives are just going to get better and better as we can go outside and stretch our wings with, with Wi-Fi and see the garden growing. And um, that also that special vegetable garden project that we have cooking up here on our farm is just the sweetest thing ever. And I can't wait to share it. So thank you all so much. Thegardenersworkshop.com. Don't forget about the free webinar. Sign up for our newsletter to learn about it. And um, until we meet again, ciao.